Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be talking all about the Kings of Napa with lead actress Ebene Noel. And I wanted to start by talking about some of the research that you did into the wine industry because mm -hmm. the team set up some wine training um, for you and the rest of the cast. And it wasn't even just about, you know, this is kind of how you would hold the glass. This is like kind of like the way that you would taste it. It was really about the manufacturing side that you could so that you could understand that entire industry and ecosystem for your characters. And so what were some of the details that you pulled out from the information that you got early on in that respect that were really helpful in understanding your character or developing certain aspects of her? I would say, first of all, how long it takes to get a vineyard um, growing grapes that are worth making a wine <laughs> out of. You know, they were like, it takes like seven years to really get your first harvest that you can, you can do something with. So that was like, okay, so if we've been waiting on being profitable for this long, like how passionate we had to be about it. Maybe the, and the age too, that August was when her family started this vineyard. Um, that was really helpful for me to think about like, okay, so what age might she have been? How influential was this in her figuring out what she wanted to do? Because, you know, I, I imagine that she didn't like grow up thinking this is what she was going to do. Um, the family kind of buys this vineyard when she's a teenager. And I think that like, it's cool to think about where that her spark and her passion started. And then also the amount of care that goes into these grapes, like how much attention um, the people working the land have to pay to get, to, to make sure they're harvesting at the right time, to make sure that, you know, any um, environmental just ups and downs that happen uh, given any season doesn't ruin the crop right and how much attention you have to pay it's not like you could just grow something make sure you weed it and water it and it's fine it's like no we have to pay daily attention to these grapes and so knowing um sort of the scope of her job right so it's not just she was the head of marketing and now she's the president of the company right so it's not just like okay there's marketing you know there's the bottling facility there's paying people there's no 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 you have to be very, very purposeful and detailed. You have to pay attention to the weather patterns. You have to make plans in advance. Like all of those little details help me figure out what the scope of her responsibility would be now. And so those are the two things that stuck out to me the most in terms of forming the character and not just, as you said, like how to hold the wine glass and how to, you know, um, uncork it and look professional. It was like, okay, what is, what are the details of her job um, and her responsibility? I love that detail that you were just mentioning about the fact that she would have been a teenager when mm -hmm. her dad first stepped into that business. And so this is something that has really been kind of like gestating with her for a long time, even before she became part of the family business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we see so much kind of innovation and imagination from her as a character like you're mentioning there that she has been heading up the marketing for the company but mm -hmm. in the first episode we see her pitching dessert wines and saying well this is how we're going to manufacture it these are the grapes that we could use this is where the gap in the market comes this is where the marketplace is right now domestically and why we should be doing this and and why it makes financial sense for the first time um and i love the fact that she comes in really strong at the beginning of that first episode as someone who never just kind of like sits there with what she knows and what feels feels comfortable, mm -hmm. but is always pushing for that next thing. And so how did that really shape a lot of her characteristics and traits for you once you saw those details in the script? Well, what I noticed is like, okay, so she's not just, she's the creative one in the family, which is why she's in marketing, right? But it's not just that she's happy with like, oh, this is the lane I'm playing in and this is what's comfortable for me. I'm gonna make a lot of money doing this and I'm cool. She's always thinking ahead and she's thinking bigger picture. So that really helped me figure out for every challenge that comes up in the season, like what is her motivation for dealing with this? Because it's not easy and it would be easy for her to say, you know what? I thought this was be, would be cute, you know, being the boss, but it's actually a lot more difficult than I thought. I'm just going to like turn it, turn this over to my brother. Right. It's no, she's not going to do that because she's always thinking about her greater vision for the company. Like you said, she's in marketing in the beginning of the pilot, but she's thinking like a boss. She's thinking like the president because she's thinking long term and for the future and how to be innovative and how to disrupt the market from the jump. So that lets me know, like, before we've even met her, she's been studying the other parts of this business. And she has 
such a deep passion and she has confidence in herself that when she gets challenged by her brother, she gets challenged by the, the, the many different family members that she has. Um, she's not wavering just because they don't think she can do it or they have a different idea because she's been actually thinking about this for a long time. And she, it's, it's what's driving her in life more so than, you know, having a family or her love life or anything like that. This is really and truly like her deep passion and drive in life. So that's, that's, that's what I learned from sort of, you know, um, those different details in the script and, and how she talks about the business from the first episode. And in terms of that drive as well, there's also kind of smaller moments where we see it, um, you know, in relationship to her father when she goes and he's just encouraging her to just like sit outside and enjoy the landscape yeah. and yeah. enjoy a beautiful glass of wine. And she's like, that sunset would look great on our latest bottle of rosé. Yeah. Even when she's at brunch with her friends, you know, there's still kind of a business moment. But did you look at those sorts of details and then view her as someone who who puts a lot of pressure on herself and, and really creates a lot of ambition and kind mm -hmm. of a level that she has kind of set for herself that she wants to achieve yes I, I those details in the script told me where her priorities are like yeah she loves her friends she loves her dad but she's her main priority is this business and this company and what they can build that's what she's thinking about all the time she wakes up thinking about she's in the shower she's getting ideas that's what she's dreaming about and I can relate to it because you know as we get older our priorities shift but definitely in the beginning of my career um, I was obsessive about how to break in, you know? It's different when you start to build and now you think, okay, what do I wanna do next? Like, where do I wanna go? But in the beginning, all of a sudden it was like, how do I break in? Like, what could else could I try? I should, you know, I've tried this, maybe I should try a different look or a different uh, hair. I gotta take this class. Like, I'm, I need to employ this technique. You know, always searching and searching and searching for breaking into this industry. I could really see that in August. She's already in the industry, but now she's searching and searching for a way to level up at all times so um yeah it told me that her main priority her main focus in life even though she loves her friends she loves her family but number one is okay how are we going to build this into something that lasts and into um something that catapults us into the world stage as like a premier winery yeah, with what you were just talking about, about, you know, that that kind of drive and, and that like, how am I going to break in? What else do mm -hmm. I need to be trying? Was there a particular moment where you kind of felt a shift where it stopped feeling like trying to break in and it did feel like you were inside instead? And how did that change things for you? Wow. Um, yes, there was a particular moment where I felt like, well, there's two, those those two moments kind of they're split. I had a moment where I booked. um it's funny because I booked a pilot that ended up not going, but <laughs> when I booked that pilot, it was, let me see, I guess it was the fourth job, like the fourth big job that I booked. I had many like co-star roles, guest star roles, kind of things like that. But the fourth thing that I booked that I was like, okay, this is a good sized part. Um, I'm supporting myself doing this. It's been a couple, like now it's been two years, right? That I can fully quit my day job and support myself. And I kind of clicked into what it takes to book a job. You know, the auditioning process is not fun for most actors. Some people love it. Some people love it, but it, it takes a while to figure out because it's not just going into a room and doing what you would do in front of a camera. Like you have to be very aware of the people in the room, it's you can't move as much, there's nerves, you don't have the job, so there's that tension. And so when I booked that job, I was like, okay, I know how to get jobs from now on and I can just sort of be confident that with the ups and downs of this industry, I know what it takes to stay here. Um, but once I, when, when my priorities shifted to when I could just think about what do I want from my career, I would say it was after FBI. You know, we were in the pen, like, my time with FBI ended right at the beginning of the pandemic. So now <laughs> I'm at home thinking, okay, well, what do I want to do next? I can't work right now anyway, because the industry was largely shut down for a while. And I was at home all day with my thoughts. <laughs> I was thinking, what do I want? Because as an actor in the beginning, you're sort of just trying to get the next job. Like, what will they let me be in? But that was the first time that I had the time and space to think, about what I wanted for myself next out of the next roles and out of the next couple of years. It was like the ending of the, everybody was like, oh, 2020 is the start of a new decade. So you were reflecting on the past one and thinking, okay, I know what I did to get here. 
um, but what's my new vision for myself? And I'd say that's the moment where I started shifting my priorities into trying anything and really focusing on what I wanted specifically out of this career. I think that's really wonderful. And jumping back to the show, I wanted to talk obviously mm -hmm. about the the family dynamic and how that yeah. influences your character as well, because, you know, there's a lot of details that play into that. You know, like I said, mm -hmm. we get to really see the essence of what her relationship with her father is, the fact that the two of them are very close early on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we get to see, there's that great dinner table scene. So we really get to see not just what her relationships are one-on-one, -on -one, but what's the group dynamic amongst the family. You know, what does it even mean for the fact for her to be the middle sibling? You know, what's the difference? between the relationship she has with her older brother and her younger brother. And so mm -hmm. there's so many aspects at play. Um, and so how did you set about, you know, shaping this idea of what these relationships and all of these dynamics would be for her within her family? And then once you were on set, really building on that foundation with the rest of the cast to find that dynamic in real time in production? Um, well, it was interesting because some things jumped right off the page. Mm -hmm. I knew that Dana and I... <laughs> <laughs> had sort of an antagonistic relationship from reading the pilot <laughs> before I even met Rance, who it's funny because our, our in real life relationship is like the opposite of our on-screen relationship. We adore each other and on screen are always at each other's throats. But when I got to Canada, because we shot this mostly in Toronto and partly in um, Niagara, and we were in quarantine for two weeks. So we couldn't meet each other. We couldn't talk to, we couldn't like have a dinner or get drinks and really get to know each other. But um, we did a cast Zoom right at the start just to lay eyes on each other. And then I, I'd said to everyone, you know, if you're open to just having individual conversations about our characters, I'm here, I'm not doing anything and I would love to just dig in. And so a lot of people responded to that. And what I found was with each of the relationships, it was a combination of my natural instincts getting having these conversations with my castmates and then also parts of my real life, right? So for an example with Dana, like I have an older brother and all I wanted my whole life was like for him to like, like, like I was just like, I just want him to like, like me. I have this older brother. I just want him to want to hang out with me, want to spend time with me. He's my older brother. He's like, you're stop. Like, I don't have time for you. Now we're, it's a different relationship and we're growing up. He's like, oh, get out of my face. And so I sort of like stole that, um, that sort of always looking up and always wanting a close relationship and not necessarily having it at the time and sort of found a way to infuse that into my relationship with Dana. Like they're always at each other's throats, but I also think that she she's not the one who wants a relationship like that. And I think deep down inside, it hurts her that he can't just like believe in her and be on her side the way that she would for him. So it's like things like that. My younger brother, I thought he's the baby that when he was born, I was the, the sister who's like, this is my baby, you know, like, this is my baby. He's my baby. I'm always hugging. And I think she has that really protect because she has that protective instinct around him and she's and um, you'll see in the series you know people are going to doubt him and his abilities he's the baby he's unproven and she's always standing up for him and I thought okay their whole childhood she was like that she's like you do not come after my little brother he's gonna be fine um even the dynamics with my mom and in the show and just thinking about my own relationship with my own mother and we adore each other but obviously mother-daughter relationships are complicated and trying to build those moments in and then also respond to what my castmates were bringing. And they were all fantastic and all had their own individual, you know, ideas and charms. So they gave me a lot to work with as well. And, and with that, that idea in mind that you just said about with her relationship with her older brother, she's not necessarily the one that wants it to be an antagonistic relationship. Mm -hmm. And we really already have seen so many instances of her coming across as the mediator. She's the person who's trying to mend things already between her mom <laughs> and between her aunt and really mm -hmm. kind of bring everybody together. You know, she doesn't see Bridget as the enemy as the, some mm -hmm. of the rest of her family immediately do once they find out, you know, that she's their sibling. Mm -hmm. um, and and so kind of similar to what you were saying earlier about how some of those early details really about her drive really influenced a lot of the motivations later on did kind of like that idea of her as a mediator and someone who really wants to create that piece and, and not have the drama influence mm -hmm. a lot of the choices that you've made throughout the season when it comes to a lot of the interpersonal dynamics, particularly knowing, you know, that she's going to be facing a lot of adversity. 
Oh, a hundred percent. I thought, I mean, my mom's middle child. And so I watched her my whole life sort of be the in-between and like wanting to keep and pull the family together. And obviously I have cousins and stuff who are middle children. And so once I learned like, okay, she's the middle child. And what does that mean? Cause I'm the youngest, right? I have an older brother and that's, that's that. So um, those dynamics are different than being in the middle and in the middle of such a large and um, opinionated family. <laughs> but I did think about that in each scenario. I mean, there's scenarios now where I have to just go for the jugular with whoever, with my brother, you know, um, with different family members. I don't want to give anything away, but I think largely she's not just looking out for herself. And I carried that throughout. There are times when, you know, family members doubt that she knows what's best and maybe they think that she's trying to do something to throw them off or um, take their power or undermine them. But I always knew with August, like this is not what she's interested in. She's never been interested in power play. She's never been interested in like, who's the best. She just wants what is best. And if your idea is that great, great. But if not, I'm not going to back down. So I definitely think those that um, tendency of, of a middle child to want to sort of like keep the peace and mediate, you'll see August display throughout the entire season. And I thought about that a lot. Yeah. And you were mentioning earlier that, you know, she doesn't have a particular focus on the romantic side of her life at the moment because of everything mm -hmm. that she's working towards. Mm -hmm. And yet because of the story arc and getting to mm -hmm. see her previous ex from several years ago, Kelvin come back into the picture through legally mm -hmm. representing her aunt, you know, we still get to kind of explore that side of her and, and yeah. the story and that element, um, you know, and there's the detail written in that the person that he ended up marrying was very much the opposite of her. And so what that means emotionally. So when it came to playing that scene where they walk into a room and they see each other for the first time and it's clear that they haven't seen each other for years because he moved back three years ago and she didn't even know that. Um, mm -hmm. How did you find what the right emotional tone and the right emotional response in terms of what she's experiencing internally, but also what she's willing to express externally in that moment? Mm -hmm. I love that question. Um, I love that question because it wasn't easy, right? I mean, we actually had to reshoot that scene. So it was interesting from the first time we shot it to the second time, because the first time we shot it, it was the first day that Curtis, Curtis Hamilton plays Calvin. It was the first day he was on set. So we did it, we never had a chemistry read. I'd met him like on Zoom, like everyone else, but like I'd never seen him in person. We didn't really have time to have a conversation. And so it was, interesting because the scene at that time had the quality of more awkwardness between them like especially when she finds out oh you've been back for a while and she knows he's married so she doesn't want to be too familiar also he's representing her aunt so there was a little more yeah maybe I'm checking him out a little bit yeah like how does he look now after so long but there was a little more um just a little more distance, a little less familiarity than the scene it turned out to be. Because by the time we reshot it, we'd been working together for a while and we're more comfortable with each other. And so then the scene changed and we were able to in infuse it with, we're very comfortable with each other. We've known each other since high school and you sort of kind of can click back into that ease with people you've known that long. And I can now use our familiarity to try and get what I want. As much as I'm like checking him out and maybe there's like a little, oh, okay. I also know that I need him to talk to my aunt about this huge loan that really is like, you know, my nightmare in life right now. <laughs> and so the second time we shot it, I was able to think about the scene in terms of, okay, they have a history and we can bring that and she can try and manipulate that history to get what she wants at the same time that all the natural feelings and instincts come in when you see an ex you haven't seen in a long time. Yeah. And then when it comes to the relationship with her dad, mm -hmm. you know, like I said before, we, we do get to see kind of like that real connectivity that the two of them have. And then yeah. there's dealing with the grief of loss when he passes away in the first episode, but then, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm imagining that the rest of the season isn't just about what does it mean for her to have lost someone that she was so close to in her life, but what is that specific grief of, you know, mm -hmm. losing the idea of who she always thought he was and the fact yeah. that so many things that she's held on to so tightly and even the way that she's looked towards her parents' marriage was mm -hmm. all kind of a fallacy and a presentation of something that was covering up other sides and other pieces, you mm -hmm. know, and figuring out what is the truth of, of what I thought to be true against, you know, 
what was kind of a mirage for me. Um, and so how did you find and explore that emotional landscape for her as a character as the episodes continued? Um, you know, I think that the script just allowed subtly it allowed space for me to take that background and think, oh, she might be reacting differently. She might, what she's feeling underneath the words might not, um, it might not be written in the script, but I can really take this loss of my dad. And also, as you've said, the loss of the idea that I had about my dad and how I'm reacting. So for instance, when she's talking about, even in the pilot, you see a glimpse of it. She says, you know, I always thought I wanted to marry someone like my dad. Right. And how ironic is that now that I've realized my dad was cheating on my mom with my aunt and keeping all these secrets and all of this stuff, like definitely don't want to marry a man like that who can, as much as I love my father, um, sort of keep those secrets, do those things anyway, but then also keep that so close to the chest for so long. Um, I think what we'll see with August is that that definitely affects the way she feels about a relationship and how safe she'll feel in a relationship and also what she's willing to deal with because now things that maybe before the pilot she would have forgiven or had more patience for, there are things that are certain triggers for her now. Um, so we definitely will see that. And also I think in the beginning, even though these secrets come out, there's so much that she's dealing with and trying to put, pull together that she's, still is trying to hang on to this hero worship that she has of her dad and the pedestal she's put him on. But as we see her mom deteriorate in certain ways throughout like the start of the season and the journey she goes on, I think it's dealing with the real, like her dad is no longer there. He can't answer for what he did. He can't give her any clarity, but what she is there, what she has to deal with is her mom. And, you know, she's fiercely protective of everyone in her family. And so she, her dad cannot answer for the things that her mom is now going through. And, um, in that, in that space and her dealing with her mom, we also see the, the changing, um, the changing perception that she has of her father and their marriage and relationships in general. So there was a lot of space within the season for her to, um, for me as an actor to infuse the scenes with that grief and that loss. And obviously every project that you work on as an actor has a different dynamic and that's not mm -hmm. even necessarily just character focused, but in terms of what is your role mm -hmm. within that production. And so what have been the unique spaces for you or the dynamics that you've been seeking to create in, in leading a show and kind of leading a show amongst, you know, such an ensemble cast as well for this project? Well, I would say, you know, I'm a Gemini. <laughs> One thing I've noticed about Gemini's um, is we love we love maintaining social the social dynamics. We like a good vibe throughout, and we don't necessarily need to be the the center of attention all the time. But we know how to fill in the spaces where it gets awkward, and like that's that's our instinct. So when I was I'm I'm the kind of person where I can always be in an ensemble. I can always play a role that's not like look at me because I I don't need. My mom says the light finds he who already shines. She's been saying that my whole life. And I think I've always felt very comfortable that no matter what role I'm in, I know that I'm going to do my best and find something juicy in it. But when you have a lead role and you're thrust in the center at the whole, the whole time, you realize that your mood and how you walk onto set is influential to everybody on the set, not just your cast, but your entire crew. And so for somebody who likes to maintain a dynamic that is fun and that is easy and that is comfortable, it was, it was a relief to sort of like not have to feel, okay, what's my position here? Should I just keep to myself? Ooh, that's not really working out. It's like, no, you're in this position. It is sort of your responsibility and you can choose, you know, not to deal with it. But if you want to be influential, you can. And to sort of test out what I always felt were my leadership capabilities, now I have the platform to do that. And so I just tried to, I just tried to make sure that everyone felt comfortable. You know what I mean? And sometimes it's not easy. We're working really long hours. People can forget lines. People can feel, you know, depending on their own experience, oh, maybe I shouldn't speak up about this. But I tried to make sure that I was looking out for um, everyone that I could and the feeling of, okay, I noticed that she didn't want to ask for 
any one thing. Oh, you don't want to ask for makeup to come in because you feel like it's an imposition. And I see you and I see that you're uncomfortable but because I'm in this position that I, I can ask and nobody's going to challenge me or even think that it's hurt. I'm going to ask for you and to just see that, okay, those little things make a difference. Now people feel like they can do their best work. And if you're doing your best work, my work's going to be better, right? Because we're all in this together. We're reacting off of each other. Just those opportunities to use my voice that I not, I haven't necessarily had on other sets because you don't want to overstep. Um, it really, it made me it affirmed things I already thought about myself and it gave me confidence moving forward that, oh yeah, I can lead a set, I can lead a cast and the skill sets that I have, um, they benefit that role. They're, they're, it's a natural boon to being in this position, what I already have been blessed with in life. I really, really love that answer and, you know, enjoyed the first episode of this season so much. And I'm so excited to see everything that we're going to get to watch with your character and with your performance the rest of the season. So congratulations and thank you so much, Ebony. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It only gets better from here. Trust me. Perfect. Can't wait. <laughs>